I'm reading the scripture today, both of them. The first is James 1, 17 to 21. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave birth to us by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved brothers and sisters, let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for human anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. And then John 15, 15 to 17. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said it to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. morning. I'm so glad to be with you this morning on this gorgeous kind of windy morning. And uh, I want you to know that we're changing things up a little bit and that our community maintenance will come after communion. And maybe some of you noticed that um, uh, the reading was not from John 15, which probably many of you know by heart, but really John 21. I'm so glad that uh, the drive was easy. I love coming up here. Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. So if we start with James, not, not my most favorite book of the Bible, scholars think it was written by a Jewish Christian in Palestine. Scholar, scholars think that by the syntax that the writer was bilingual, which many people were during those times. James was not at first included in the canon of scripture, which first started to pull together around 200 of the common era, but it is included in the canon that was determined almost 200 years later in 387 of the common era. But just because it's not in the canon does not mean it was not circulating and was not of import to the people that read it. There was a lot of literature that got sifted through over and over again. And so we can still see that it has stayed the test of time, but over a thousand years later, Martin Luther expressed doubt about the inclusion of James in the canon, because you can imagine if you have um, grace as your um, center point that all the do's and all the um, kind of lawful language of James is not so comfortable or also that because we, we think we know who James was but no one's ever really known who it is. So in the James passage um, we are called to be quick to listen slow to speak, slow to anger, and to welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save our souls. I don't know what implanted means for people who didn't do surgery. I seem to have an implant in this knee. So you'll have to take that um, um, from our you know, 21st century point of view, but I wonder what it meant to people, you know, in the first century. So this paragraph of being quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger 
and welcome with meekness. Um, the word with the power to save our souls is really against our current culture. Our political scene right now seems to be driven by anger. So to hear that anger does not produce righteousness is really part of the upside down kingdom. The author calls us beloved brothers and sisters. Again, it is our belovedness, the grace from Jesus that we are fully and entirely loved by God that makes our Christian life possible. This passage speaks to me um, because I am, you may have noticed, not at all slow to speak. And I get angry really quickly. I go from zero to 10 in an instant. Now, at my age, I have learned to control my anger and I get angry much less frequently. But it helps to know that anger is just an emotion. It's not bad or good, it's a feeling. And feelings come and feelings go. But I do believe in righteous anger. Anger can lead to social change, like in the civil rights movement. Even Jesus was angry when he cleared the temple. I hope you remember that the den of thieves he talks about is not that money was changing hands, but that the courts of the temple that were being used to buy and sell things were the only places that Gentiles and women, the outcasts, were allowed to worship. They were not allowed to go where the Jewish men were allowed to go. They certainly were not allowed into the Holy of Holies where only a few were allowed. But the marketplace was where the outcasts could be because, of course, you know, if you discount someone's humanity, you don't mind taking up their space. I think that colonialism teaches us plenty about just taking over people's spaces. But women were allowed in the temple and Gentiles were allowed in a different court. These are two different courts that are the outside rim where you would expect commerce to go on. But the practice of buying sacrifices is not what Jesus is criticizing here. He is criticizing that there's an injustice going on and it causes him to have righteous anger. Anger can be a suit of armor that we wear when we are feeling attacked or too exposed. It, like a force field or shield, it can pop up. That's how I feel it happens with me to protect me. I go to anger first sometimes, but it does not produce righteousness, but it is a natural human emotion with an obvious place in our lives. I don't know if I'm the only one that gets angry, but sometimes as Christians, we like to pretend we don't get angry. And sometimes that's about Iowa, or I would say Minnesota nice. And it has kind of a subtext of stuffing our emotions. So I think the free expression of anger in appropriate ways is part of our human condition. My experience as a chaplain has helped me to be slower to speak, since it's not my nature, because I've learned to embrace silence and I don't feel a need to fill silence with my words. Sometimes silence can lead to deeper conversations and be a path to follow to discover the real issue at hand. Ephesians 4, 5 tells us, be angry, but do not sin. And of course, Psalm 4, 4 says, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. So scripture in other places has a real acceptance of anger. We're called to name our anger but to not let it get the best of us. As a kid, as you can imagine from what I've said, I threw a lot of temper tantrums. In reflection, I think I was acting out with the skills of a young child in a situation that didn't always make sense to me. And I'm kind of glad that I was acting out against a very dysfunctional situation. Um, I think that it caused me to have kind of a personal inner strength not that the anger was good. Oh, you should see me when I cry. I just look like, like the worst possible person. I just get completely red and puffy and it lasts for hours. And so I, at one point, I think I was in seventh grade where you start to really care about these things. I really think I cried almost every day till seventh grade when I just decided, you know, I just can't cry like this or people will think I'm ugly at school. 
That's how seventh graders think. No, I don't think that so much. But um, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us to put away childish things. And so I think that most of us have already done much of that work. For me, I started to feel a sense of call by doing the next right thing. Back when we used to be able to get, I'm so glad there's no one really young in, in the group. I think um, you are all younger than me, but um, we used to be able to get cassette tape copies of the weekly sermon. Did any of you go to a church like that? Did you guys have cassettes way back when? I can't believe that was considered you know, cutting edge technology, but I missed the whole eight track tape thing because I just never, they kind of were concurrent. Um, anyway, we got, as a family, we loved the sermon that our pastor had preached um, called Do the Next Right Thing. And so we got a copy of it and listened to it several different times. And um, we had, you know, we only would buy a couple of year and listen to them in the car and other things. Um, during that period of my time, I was listening to a lot of Raffi and children's music. So um, the spoken word was some of the only adult stuff I got to hear. Um, but I had young kids, of course, when I first started volunteering. And I did so out of obligation to do my share of the shared work and to give myself to the church and to God wholeheartedly. Um, as I worked with kids on Wednesday night programs, camps, Bible studies, I found that kids started to seek me out. Because I was open to them, they found me open and would find me to talk about all different things. Kids would just appear that wanted to talk. And more and more opportunities came my way. I began to help teach our summer staff that came on for our outreach programs and give workshops. I directed a traveling camp for several summers for kids um, going into seventh grade, planning all the meals and mapping everything and doing the content long before there was GPS. I drove the bus because the driver was needed and I had a class B license. That's another whole story. But Ecclesiastes 9.10, tells us, and I know it's just a reminder, whatever your hands find to do, do with all your might. After a few years, I started to have this desire in my prayer life to bless others in a more, I don't really have the words for this, in a more all-encompassing way. It was the sense, my sense of being a vessel filled with the Holy Spirit and serving the world increased in my spiritual life where I had this desire to serve the world in a broader way. By then, we had started a non-denominational church, so I went to the seminary that my pastor had gone to. I loved the intellectual exercise of seminary, but spiritually it was not as fulfilling for me. It seemed more about dogma than connection to God. You have heard that silly saying, right? Don't let your dogma run over my karma. Um, it's one of my silly favorites. So there was a time of tumult at the school. It was Bethel Seminary, a general conference, so middle of the road Baptist school. And there were many different denominations that attended. Um, and since I'd never been Baptist, I was a little detached even to start from, from the body as a whole because it was a denominational school, but it was so interfaith that um, um, I felt somewhat at home. But the Southern, well, it was a time of tumult in the church, and the Southern Baptists have recently voted the same way in a more restricted way quite recently. But back then, the Southern Baptists, um, the conservative relatives of the seminary I went to, um, voted to um, defrock any women that were senior pastors. So in other churches that might have one or two pastors, the senior pastor is what we in our tradition called lead pastors. And so that meant that a woman could not be the solo pastor of a church. She would have to be an assistant. And during this time, you know, I was getting my Master of Divinity, um, but there were fewer of us and more women that were getting their masters in Christian education. 
which was kind of considered the appropriate avenue for women. And um, one of my good friends that I'll talk about was a missions major, and that was also considered very acceptable. But we um, DIV students, when we'd raise our hand in class, um, oftentimes a male student would just correct us from the class. Um, and I left one classroom and this amazing student, because remember from the last time I was here, the, from just last week, that you know I'm not such a great student, um, and I struggle to do different scholarly type things, although I do love it. Um, but she said, you know, he spoke like that to you because you're just a woman who spoke up, and he just doesn't think that's appropriate. So the, we had a lot of conversation in the seminary about women's roles um, in the late 90s and early 2000 when I was in seminary. So all those women, there were only about eight of them in Minnesota, lost their jobs. But like a lot of higher education, the faculty were more progressive than the students. So I received what I think is a really good education. But there were a few incidents. Once I was in a church leadership class, and I was the only woman, and it was one of our smaller classes, so it was me and 12 men learning how to lead a church. And we were scheduled to lead a mock board meeting and use the skills we were learning in class that day. The professor had been an interim pastor of mine, so he knew me by name. And, um, you know, he kind of knew me. And he asked for a volunteer to lead the meeting. Now, in this group of men, remember, I am not slow to speak. There were several people from African descent um, that language, their language was not English as their first language, so they weren't going to volunteer. And, you know, I'm an outgoing person. So I raised my little hand, and he said to me, well, he didn't really say anything at first. He just laughed out loud and said, Libby, you will not be leading church board meetings, but we can let you lead in class today. And I led the meeting. In preaching class, I gave a sermon and used a story about the fall of a baseball player you may remember or not called Daryl Strawberry. Remember, this was a long time ago. And I had read about it in the New York Times Magazine, and I thought it was a great um, concrete example of whatever I was talking about, because I sure don't remember it. Um, and the professor, when he was giving me feedback, asked me where I had stolen the sermon from. I really wonder if he would have asked any male student that, but for me, talking about baseball maybe was just completely out of his scope of understanding. I really don't know why um, why he spoke to me that way. And uh, he pressed me on it. And I told him that I'd used this article as what I thought was a really good um, reference and um, that my work was my own. At the next class meeting, I brought him the magazine. I took it out of the recycling and just put it on the desk, didn't say anything. And of course, he said nothing. Really, a month, maybe it was two months later, the seminary holds a preaching contest every year. And it has a cash prize. And I submitted that sermon, because it was the best one of mine. My professor, the same one, was also on the selection jury. And he was kind enough to sit me down and tell me that my work was one of the best sermons and that he had selected it to go forward. So I became one of the few finalists, I think there were six or eight, in that competition. I have to say that I didn't really want to compete for giving a sermon. I do love them and love preparing them and giving them. So I went with several couples and my husband at the time to the Bahamas instead. <laughs> It tells you I don't have that. Don't play Monopoly with me, but in general, I'm not that, I'm not that competitive of a person. Um, I'm a younger sister, so we're always trying to work hard to measure up to the older siblings. It became clear to me that although I felt called to preach and teach, that there really wouldn't be any job opportunities for me. 
And then I would say my theology was a little bit more conservative, although I've never been conservative about um, justice or peace issues or loving people that are different. Um, most of the openings on the seminary page, and this really went forward for a long time as I would search for jobs, many years, that it specified in the ad a devout man of God. And so one of my friends was in charge of all of the placements for the seminary, and he worked very hard to change that. But that went on, I think, maybe it's still going on. I haven't looked at that site in a long time. But I am a devout person, but I am not a devout man of God. So when it came, in seminary we had to do two internships, and we all had majors. My major was pastoral care. And I was non-denominational, so I knew I wasn't going to a Methodist church or an American Baptist church or something like that at the time. So I knew I was kind of still an outlier in a different category. So I chose chaplain, a chaplain CPE unit. And I know most of you are not familiar with that, but it's called clinical pastoral education. Um, and a lot of seminaries require it so that you can learn not only how to operate in an interfaith context, which is helpful for anyone, but so that pastors um, have kind of a reflective, self-introspective way of looking because that's the teaching model of clinical pastoral education. In fact, we joke about it and say, um, among, among people who have done CPE, how are things with your mother? Because what we would do is we would um, visit patients, write down word for word what had happened, a verbatim is what it's called, and then we would write a paper about it and reflect on it and present that to our cohort. I think my cohort had six people, and they're usually under seven people in these cohorts. And then the group would ask you questions about it. So why'd you ask that question? What is that about? Is that about your relationship with a family member, or how are how are you doing with um, that that kind of person? Do you have some prejudices or biases that we need to work through? So it's a it's a deep learning model. It's based on psychodynamic theory, and it started, I believe, in the 50s and. Uh, Bethel did not require it um, because they weren't interested in people becoming interfaith. So again, I was just a little bit different. Um, so the clinical pastoral ed education um, made it seem like a road to chaplaincy, although I really had no idea what it was, was more viable. So I applied at the University of Minnesota Hospital and was accepted. On the second day of the internship, I was driving through downtown Minneapolis, um, where 94 goes, starts to head off toward um, St. Paul, for those of you who know the Twin Cities, and 35W goes north. I was right about there. When the radio said that a small plane had hit the World Trade Center in New York City. And so it became a very significant time for our group and our supervisor, so a CPE supervisor goes on for several years of training past their chaplain training to be able to be called a supervisor for these groups. Um, but she, Laura Kelly was her name, um, forever called us, because I ran into her in Eau Claire when I lived there, um, the 9-11 group because of the ripple effect that kind of shifted everything about um, not only chaplain practice, but everything going on in the hospital. And as you may recall, there was this undercurrent at the time, not only of fear, um, but of deep grief. And you know that when you have one grief, it brings up all your other losses. And so we had, we had quite the quarter, I would say. And um, as discouraging as my experience at seminary had been, as far as affirming my gifts, I took to chaplaincy like a duck takes to water. And there are two levels in CPE, and most people spend a few units getting to level two. In general, to work in a hospital, this isn't as true anymore. You need four of these quarters to be able to be um, a certified chaplain. 
And, uh, but I progressed quickly. I liked, I liked that psychodynamic learning. I was open to it. And, you know, because I'm an outspoken person, um, I didn't have any problems asking people questions in group. And my supervisor said during one of our meetings, kind of mid-unit, Libby, I'm putting you to level two. You've got this. You're good at this. You're called to professional ministry. Just keep getting on with it. That was so different than my previous three years in seminary had been um, to graduate like that kind of mid-quarter. So I did the next right thing and applied for a second unit of CPE. At this point, I was going for those four units. And again, it filled my requirements as a second internship, but it was another fabulous learning environment for me. I befriended a man with HIV who was just such a lovely person. And back then, HIV was really a death sentence, which it is not anymore. So he had a sense that he was living day to day and that he wanted every day to count. So I was really inspired by him always. And I ministered to a lot of people. It was an inner city rehab hospital. And uh, a particular woman, I just, just adored her. I just thought she was the greatest thing. She had been only six months sober, so she did not qualify for a liver transplant. And so I accompanied her as she became ready to die. And it was an honor and a privilege, and really the first time I had done that except for emergencies um, in my previous um, internship. So after I graduated, I kept going and applied for a year-long residency of CPE, which gave me four units in just that year. So I had a total of six units, more than I needed for getting a job. Um, but I did with the intention of specializing in psych. You can imagine that from maybe some of the other things that I have told you. In that second internship, many of my patients had had a psychiatric diagnosis as well as the reason they were in the rehab hospital. So they'd come out of the hospital maybe with um, some kind of injury, and then because I sat in on rounds and things like that, I knew that they had another diagnosis as well. And so I had built such great rapport with those people, I just thought, well, maybe this is the right path to take. So some of determining your own call is, what are you good at? So I spent a full year at Abbott Northwestern Hospital on their four psychiatric units, seeing patients, learning to do groups, and I had great mentors that were music therapists and art therapists, as well as a few doctors. And because of that training, I was able to get a job at a freestanding behavioral health hospital in a Chicago suburb, and my learning continued. How did I persevere through seminary without the affirmation of that particular system? I had a deep knowing that I was called. And that's what propelled me forward, even though I could have been discouraged at many different, many different crossroads. My spirituality held me together, and I could discern os obstacles that I faced to just call them human foibles that I could see that God was working in their lives, but they just didn't have the understanding of women in leadership. So it's not that I faulted them or blamed them. And because I hadn't really been affirmed except by Laura Kelly um, and people that told me to go to seminary before that, um, that was my normal. Just like a lot of things, whatever's normal for you is what you accept. Um, so I wanted to do what I felt God was calling me to do. And I also had a friend. I had a friend in seminary. She was a year ahead of me, Krista. Krista and I are still friends. She lives in St. Paul, so I don't get to see her very often. And Krista and I processed for a long time. We validated each other. Her internships had taken her to facilitate microbanking for women in Rwanda. And she never pursued an actual ministry job after that and is still kind of rocking it in banking. And she's on the boards of different mission organizations in Minnesota. 
Her ongoing affirmation of my experience made all the difference. There was a witness, someone believed me, and had experienced very similar things. And in CPE, my gifts for ministry were clearly affirmed by my supervisor. Um, and I found that um, I fit in well in the hospital environment. But I still really wanted to pastor a church. The John scripture for today is the passage that I hang on to as my call to ministry verses. And as I mentioned before, it's really John 21. It's the last chapter of John. And instead of Jesus getting ready to die or teaching, he is back from the dead. <laughs> and so it's an important distinction to make that we're at the end of the book and the disciples meet the resurrected Jesus. And they don't name him until his conversation with Peter, but they without question know who he is. And they meet him in their fishing milieu. And so it is a familiar place that they meet him. And call narratives, and this scripture is not really in those few um, stories in scripture that are called call narratives, but it has several elements of it. And the call narratives, you may have heard this before, follow a certain pattern. God or a representative of the divine interrupts a human being, think of that burning bush, and there's an introductory chat so that the person knows they're talking with an angel, an emissary of God, or they just hear a voice and they know it's God, um, the creator. And the person is being asked to go on a mission, do something, or um, carry out a task for the Almighty. And usually there's an objection. Oh no, not me. Send my brother Aaron, would you please, God? Um, and um, after that, there's usually a reassurance of God's providence or love, something that tells the person that they are accepted and they are part of the beloved community. And then there's often a sign or an event, like Jonah falling overboard into the mouth of a big fish, or like Simeon becoming mute, or Paul becoming blind. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is seen as kind of an outlier of this genre of literature um, because she does push back a little by saying, how can this be? But then she, she doesn't really try to get out of it. She just says, be it according to your will, pretty quickly. So she's considered different because she doesn't suggest someone else for the job. Um, this genre has six parts. And maybe you've seen this pattern in your own life. Maybe you have heard that still small voice and maybe as you contemplate your own call or mission, um, think of this story from John, even though it's a little different. So there's a confrontation with God. This is what an Old Testament Hebrew scholar would say. The resurrected Christ appears and they know him. This is earlier in the chapter than our verses. Then there's an introductory speech. He asks them about their fishing and gives them instructions. Put it down on the right side, Jesus said. And later, more personally, he asks Simon Peter if he loves him. And then he imparts a mission. In this passage, Jesus says three different times, different ways, feed my lambs. There's an objection or pushback, and there really isn't in this particular narrative but Peter was hurt by Jesus' questioning. And he, he is upset that in relationship, Jesus has to ask him three times. But remember, Peter is the one, so this is, could also be a literary device, who denies Jesus three times. So it may be a literary device, or it may be that there was something about how to reconcile this relationship that has been passed down, because that's the fascinating part to me. Um, maybe Jesus asks him that three times as a parallel. There are parallels with other verses in scripture, and sometimes scholars and people who write those little headings call it Peter's reinstatement. Then there's reassurance by God. Jesus trusts him to care for the lambs. 
doesn't ask him questions. Are you ready? He just wants to know if, if he loves Jesus. And then a little bit later after the passage we read today, Jesus is more directive and just says, follow me. And then there's a sign, and I'm guessing that that's earlier in the passage where exactly 153 fish were caught for these few disciples, and that Peter is forgiven is not obvious in this, but he is back in relationship with the risen Christ. And so even though after his death, Peter denies him, Jesus, without saying, without calling him to task, saying what he did wrong, without bringing up those three denials, um, unless it's more subtle or some would say passive aggressive, do you love me? Um, but Peter, uh, Peter loves him, and that's what the gospel is about, our love for each other. Um, Peter is forgiven without being told he is forgiven. He is in, in this moment, with the resurrected Christ across from him in a restored relationship with the resurrected Christ. And that, I would say, is definitely a sign since any of those encounters were somewhat supernatural um, with the resurrected Christ. Romans 5, 8 and following says, for while we were weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So Peter is just one of the early recipients of this overarching, unconditional love of God. So I wonder, what's the next right thing for you? What does that still small voice ask from you, affirm in you? If you're objecting, maybe it's a good thing. Have you seen any signs of affirmation? Are you in conversation with God about what you may sense is going on? Maybe, like me, you are forgiven for everything before you even ask and without being told directly that you are forgiven. Amen.